Welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, April 25th meeting of the North Andover uh, Board of Health. Um, it is now 7.02. Uh, I'm Dr. Frank McMillan. This meeting is being recorded. I now call the meeting to order. First item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes which were distributed previously. Are there any corrections? No, minutes have been uh, critiqued, and I make a motion that they are uh, approved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second to approve the minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The minutes are approved. Uh, there are no public hearings. Um, what we will do is we will move into, uh, for the courtesy of our guest here, communications, announcements, and discussions. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, uh, back for the board uh, again, looking for uh, really before. We were talking about uh, two separate areas. One was the, at the east end of the property was uh, a temporary structure for storing of the processed wood outside of the building. And then at the west end, uh, we were talking about a, a separate structure for storing uh, baled material. I, I'll take that one off of the table. I'm really here just to talk about the one at the east end, mm -hmm. which would be the temporary structure for the uh, processed wood that is uh, going out for a recycle. I, I mean, it, it, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but right now, the, one of the facilities that takes our wood is on um, repair of some of their equipment. So we're having to stockpile it in uh, not our normal tipper trailers, which are the type that we send that material up. We're using some of our walking floors. Mm -hmm. Tipper trailer, uh, big trailer, no moving parts to it. Uh, it goes up to their facility and they've got a hydraulic system that'll take the whole tractor, the whole trailer, and tip the whole thing up in the air, and the wood chip comes out. Wow. But those tippers are up for repair right now, are being repaired. So we're going to the walk-on floor. But it's one of the reasons why uh, we are uh, here looking to do this is because that's our main facility for the recycled wood. And if they have any kind of issues that they can't take material, we're going to start stockpiling it inside the building, and we only have so much space inside the building. And that's why we're looking to, to add a, uh, a structure next to the building that would just be for that process wood, and that's it. Nothing else will be in there. This is what we've seen before with the, uh, the, the built-in sides, the covering, and? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize you were going to be splitting them up. Um, he gave us and submitted what they submitted to DEP, which mm -hmm. is their annual renewal, as well as the uh, minor modification request to DEP. Mm -hmm. So this was this was some fun reading. Let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. So, so <laughs> to make it easy for the board, I mean, I'll I'll deal with the the second structure, the the one at the west end of the property that we, if we were looking to to do. Um, more storage if we had some baled material. Okay. I'll just take that off the table now. Right. It, it's the wood one is the one that really is uh, the main focus uh, for us right now. Okay. Um, I did speak to Mark Fairbrother, TEP. I did read this lovely packet, and I did Sorry draft some questions and some a basic synopsis for the board. I just gave that to you guys. I just finished that tonight. Um, I had it lumped in as both because that was basically in front of me. Um, so basically what we're here tonight for is to determine if this is a minor modification to the site assignment or if this is just a um, simple approval to modify what they're doing but still within the actual site assignment that's already on record and the board already approved back in 2006. Um, I basically went through and drafted up a quick little overview of what TBI is and what they do and then what the proposals are. So obviously the purpose is we're here to discuss the site assignment and the proposal from TBI, decide whether or not a public hearing is needed to issue the minor modification to the site assignment 
or if you can think you can move forward and they can I can approve the building permit applications and things like that um, so back in 2006 they got the site assignment for a C&D recycling facility um, C&D is separated into its various materials and then the waste and the materials are transported off-site um, so they get the, the paper, the cardboard, the wood, painted wood, metals, stone and aggregate, things like that are all separated out. And the residual waste are then stored and then shipped off site, correct? Correct. Okay. So this proposal, TBI wants to do a two-phase modification. Uh, phase one would be an inside modification only, and they want to install the residual waste baler for storage and transport of waste being shipped off site. So that's the stuff that you guys can't recycle. Ship it off and it's incinerated or landfill? Yeah, the, the bale materials would be landfilled. Okay, all right. Uh, phase two would be to construct the two temporary structures. Um, one is an 80 by 73 flex bin structure adjacent to um, this uh, structure for storage process clean wood chips right next to the building that's there now, uh, which does raise some questions speaking to the building department um, and the structure itself. The other structure is a 100 by 50 steel master building um, system over the existing residential drop-off area. And that's the one you're going to put off until later? Yeah, that okay. one, if, if the board is, you know, would like to see one before both, Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be more than happy to, to get going on the wood one. Okay. And once everything is, is up running on that, then we could talk about the second one. Right. So that would be for the residual, uh, the material that's going to be shipped off site as well as the residential recycling drop off area um, going through the site assignment I gave that to you guys a couple meetings ago I think it's also in his application for uh, the DEP and it's also in the package for you guys tonight I went through the site assignment looked at what was proposed basically came up with a couple of points and things to basically think about and talk about and discuss as to what's approved already and what they're proposing um, so when the site assignment was done, the board issued a lot of conditions that were attached inside the site assignment. I went through those and picked out the ones that were basically relevant for this project only. Um, one of the things that popped up was all waste handling operations must be conducted inside a 30,000 square foot fully enclosed building, which then kind of raises some questions right there. Um, provide a residential drop-off recycling center for North Middle residents that has a separate entrance from the C&D area. Um, ensure trucks could navigate the driveway and allow 10 trucks to queue on site, five in front of the scale house and five for overflow. And then a turning radii for WB55 vehicles, which I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds like a specific class or the largest you guys would have. Uh, WB would be wheelbase. Okay. And then tonnage is limited to 500 tons per day. Um, section five basically goes through some of the questions that that raised in terms of the overall proposal and what we have for an existing site assignment. Um, the operation is limited to inside operations only and within a fully enclosed building only. Um, I don't know if these new buildings actually violate that condition because they're open. There are temporary structures, they're open, and they're not fully enclosed. Um, are the structures considered temporary or permanent? Um, the building commissioner says that temporary structures probably can't be there for more than 60 days. He's looking into that for me. I think the idea of temporary is they're not permanent, which these aren't because they're movable. They're um, <coughs> cargo container based. Yeah, we would look to uh, double stack in a mortal containers up against the building. If you if you're driving down Holt Road, it would be that that section of the building that you see first. Mm -hmm. So we would look to butt them up against the building. So the back part of the uh, of our existing building would be butted right up against the this. Uh, fabric structure. Yeah. So th they would share that common wall, would come out towards the east, and we could have it so that there is a, uh, a fabric structure on the that other east end with a drive-through door. Okay. So um, it would be metal containers up, uh, you know, call it 16 feet, and then it would be the fabric structure up. He also mentioned that temporary structures may not be able to be within so many feet of a permanent structure. There may need to be some separation for I don't know if it's fire access or what that situation is. He was looking into it more, um, but we didn't kind of close that loop yet. Um, and then do the structures, when combined, do they exceed the 30,000 square foot limit that you guys have now? 
I don't know what the size of your building is now. We were at 30,000. We 30, for the waste handling area. And that was, you know, that was okay. part of that question with you was, well, this is the recycled material. Right. It, it's, you know, the waste, waste handling is still going on in the 30,000 square foot yep. building. This is, this is the wood material that it's now a recycled material. It's no right. longer waste. It's a recycled product that okay. is being reused. And that, that was the, the question. That's a, a gray area, I guess. I talked to Mark at DEP. He couldn't answer that. He said that's up to the board to decide. So this is your side assignment. You guys can take a look at it and look at the questions and kind of debate it and go back and forth. But so are clean wood chips considered waste? Um, obviously, they're outside the building and they're outside that 30,000 square foot area that's been um, set by the site assignment. And then uh, clean wood chips may or may not be considered waste, but since it's part of the operation, does it also need to be inside? So as part of the operation, does that classify it as an inside, even though it's not waste, but does need to be inside still? The wood chips that are, are coming out are, would be similar to what you would see landscape would have, bark mulch, except our wood, uh, you know, the bark mulch has a high moisture content. Yeah. That's why you see them s steaming, and sometimes they catch on fire where our wood ha has a real low moisture content because it's been kiln it's, dried. It's mostly. been in people's houses for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's got a very low moisture content. So we don't have those issues right. of them. It's steaming or spontaneously yeah. combusting. Mm -hmm. um, and that raises like, another question with the bailed C and D residual waste. Does that need to be stored inside too? I know you guys have an area in there now that's proposed in the uh, interior modifications that has an area set aside for the baled waste inside, or an option is storing it outside in the other temporary structure. Correct. So that's kind of up in the air right now and can go either way depending on where you guys want to go. I mean, even the the fabric structure that we were talking about in the, yeah. you know, on the east end, if the board likes the the steel structure um, that we were proposing for the west end, I'm more than happy to change the east end over to that steel structure and get rid of the fabric. It's you know that both of them would yeah. be on intermodal containers okay um another question i had was you guys have the resident drop-off area with its own entrance and its own area should that resident drop-off area be separate from the cnd residual waste storage area right now it's combined under that one structure i don't know if that should be separate to stick with the intent of the original site assignment to keep those areas and that those processes kind of segregated from each other. One of the reasons, I mean, we had talked a little bit about that, why we would we were maybe looking to put a separate structure over there uh, for that, especially with the drop-off area, was we could try to get the drop-off area under cover. Yep. So now people wouldn't have to come over there and have to deal with rain, snow, mm -hmm. and, and we'd okay. get it so people could come over there and get out of their cars dry, get back in their cars yes. dry, and never have to worry about it. Okay. Um, another question was, what's the current tonnage per day you guys are doing? Uh, we're averaging uh, probably in like the 360. Okay. Thanks okay. for that. Oh, and it's capped at 500 um, through the original. I didn't know if you guys had kind of gotten to that limit yet. No. no okay. Not yet. Um, so with those questions being raised, there's definitely some things to discuss and think about as a board to see how it fits in with what you guys have, what the board approved uh, back in 2006. Does this have to be done at a public hearing? You can discuss it now to decide if it does trigger a site assignment modification or if what you have, and nothing's been formally presented except this, and I've got one copy of it. It's just discussion right now. Mm -hmm. It can move forward either way. But at least now we have something more concrete to look at. And I've got plans here. And this right here is uh, what DEP has? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that was submitted to the DEP. So we got plans, and basically the synopsis covers what this is. Right. When would you like to have uh, approval? When do you need approval, I should uh, say? I mean, it's up to the board. I mean, obviously, we work on your schedule. Whatever you would, whatever you would like. I mean, obviously, the sooner the better for us. I mean, we'd love to, we'd now, love the, to get going the on. The reason I, I, I say is that uh, some of this I have not seen before, and it's at best very difficult to make a decision. I, I, I certainly would like to tour your facility. I haven't been there for many, many years. And by the way, um, 
this is the field that I'm in. I'm in a similar field as you, and I just came from a very large facility. I flew in an hour ago, less than an hour ago, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. So I have a good idea what this is all about, but I don't know the specifics because I haven't seen this before. Sure. So I, I like to stop by your plant sometime. Yeah, absolutely, anytime. Soon. I'm up for and, it. Uh, yeah, I'd love to go. And see it. You'd yeah. like to go too? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the basic structure of what we're talking about is what the town put up at the behind the new DPW yard for the salt storage. Yep. I mean, it, it's very similar to, to that. Okay. Be nice if we can set up a tour sometime uh, sooner the better, perhaps next week. Okay. I'd love to. I've been meaning Would to that go be there okay? for Absolutely. a few weeks now. So the real question yeah. is... Is, is this product or is this waste? And I guess the issue with, you know, having product, I mean, it's, it's dry wood, it's combustible. I mean, uh, I, I, has our fire chief weighed in on? Fire chief, no, but they were talking, one of the um, fire prevention officer that I spoke to briefly said he would have to look at it. He hasn't gotten any information on it yet, but he doesn't know if there's a limit to the size of the pile that can be there as one combustible material, and it would need to be sprinklered. Well, that, I, that's exactly what I was thinking right. about. It's like you know, you got a temporary structure now with uh, with piping. steel steel piping. Yes. Um, and you know, and it's and it is close. I mean, it, it is a budding. You know, when I look at this drawing right here, it's a budding. It's a budding the other structure. I mean, we've. I mean, I've been there for a diesel truck fire. Um, maybe a year or two ago. Um, I guess my, my concern is is that, you know, I, I, I don't have so much of an issue with it being a, a product versus waste. I'll ex I'm inclined to accept it as product, but I don't, I don't know about whether it belongs where it is. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason, I'll be honest with you, the reason why we, we look to put it right next to the building is because right now the the wood as it uh, goes through the plant goes through the grinder mm -hmm. uh, is conveyored up and it drops in a bunker that the very east end of the building is is where the drive-through pit is just to the left of that pit is where the bunkers are that store the wood mm -hmm. and the conveyors are up at the top of the up, up very high in the building yep so we would be able to extend those conveyors over the pit, them. and it would drop right into, and, and that's the reason why we were looking to butt it up close, is so that the, the wood would be uh, dropped uh, in the temporary structure without even having to hit the ground a second time and be picked up and moved outside of the building right. uh, manually. What's the end use of this wood? Uh, a lot of this wood, uh, some of it goes up into Canada. Uh, the rest of it, a lot of it goes up into Maine. That's the main location. It goes up to uh, Sappy Fine Paper up in, uh, up in Maine. Uh, they use, uh, I think, a lot of the, the wood they use uh, in the paper making process, but not to make the paper. I think it's used in other parts of that process. So it's not turned into Seems paper. It's to send wood to Maine. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, uh, in, some, in some regards, they probably use it to offset um, using any kind of other fossil fuels. Probably. I know they, there are a lot of wood combustors in Maine. Yeah, so they, yeah. they get a lot of green chip, which yeah. has a real high moisture content, hence it's green. And, and low they, BTU. Yep, yeah, and they mix and in. Tough to burn. Yeah, yeah, and they mix in a lot of our nice dry wood mm -hmm. in, a, in a combination and uh, offset having to use uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I'm struggling with and talking to the building department about it, they're not sure yet. They started looking into it for us. Um, but is it temporary or is it permanent? Mm -hmm. I think if there's, he said, yes, it's movable, but it's going to be a fixture there. So does it cross that threshold in terms of it's there, it's temporary, but it's going to be there forever or for as long as you guys need it, which could be decades. Well, the definition so, you said earlier was 60 days or less. That's what he thinks. He thinks the temporary so, structure should be 60 days. How does that weigh into this equation here? And that probably would not like, suffice. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's the way people refer to those type of buildings. Uh, that's yeah. why, when I call it a temporary build, it's, it's only because that's what they refer to them as, temporary right. buildings. They're not. So, I think the biggest question is temporary versus permanent, as well as the overall square footage of the operation that's been approved. Because if you're at 30,000 square feet now, granted these aren't huge buildings, 
but it's an additional square footage that will put you over that initial site assignment approval. Right. If the board d determined that the wood was a waste handling area, I agree. But if the if the board saw fit to see the wood as being a recycled yeah. product, uh, I I think I had given you maybe some definitions right from the the, yes. the code of mass regulations yep. that that you know it, I'm in probably the reason why right. Mark Fairbrother in, in, again he wouldn't he, I think he's yes. been he's been around enough to know that. Uh, he's not going to step on a board's correct by interjecting what he thinks. But I know, uh, and I don't know if you talked to Mark uh, and, and it had come up, that there are other facilities that have wood storage outside of their existing building that they transfer it over. Okay. Um, but uh, it would, you know, it would take this board to to agree that the wood as a saleable product is not a waste, so we're not expanding the waste handling area that was defined in the site assignment at 30,000 square feet, that this is not waste, it is a recycled product, so that it would still fall under the 30,000 square foot waste handling area, that we're right. not expanding the waste handling area. That That's really... That's a, that's a million dollar question, I think. Yeah. But I think it's... The intent of the initial site assignment was a 30,000 square foot waste handling area, and that's what it's waste handling operation. Is that operation or is that waste handling or both combined? I don't know, but that's something that I think the board needs to think about and ponder, um, digest. Uh, I asked legal, they didn't really have an opinion yet. Definitely didn't expect to get the answer tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think we can answer this tonight. But, but I'm leaning toward, uh, it, it, indeed, it's a saleable product. I mean, you, you're going to sell it and make some money. Yes. No, Whereas, good, you don't sell waste to, to make money. Decide, oh, I'd love to. Yeah, if there was public. somebody out there willing to uh, buy my trash that uh, we take in, absolutely, I'd do it. But you're right. It, there, is a, there is a difference. Yeah, so the DP basically said, have the board talk about it. Let me know what you guys think. He's here to support us. He said, give him a call next week. We can sit down and go over everything again. Um, he's waiting on us to basically take one step forward to see where we want to go. So you're looking at perhaps setting up a meeting tomorrow, uh, next week, and I informing us uh, sure. regarding our availability. And Do the site walk and kind of go through there. but. Okay. I'm a, whenever okay. you're available, I'm available. Well, I'm one of five members, so, you know, it's... it's <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think that you guys definitely should contemplate and discuss um, the operation, the square footage, the temporary versus permanent structures, and kind of think, get a feel for what you guys... What you I guys think I've always here. been impressed with their operation. Again, I've been to many of these facilities around the country and the world. And uh, yeah. you're, you're top shelf. You well, really we try are. To, we try to keep uh, we try to keep it clean. And uh, you know the the paper wood, the you know the, that wood is a is a big component of the waste stream. You know, you know we uh, we definitely want to try to recycle as much of it as we can. And th uh, this would just uh, assist us in in getting as as much as out of the waste stream as we can. More efficient. Better being able to stockpile it because we can only stockpile so yeah. much, and, right. uh, and, and if Sappy goes down uh, for any maintenance issues, it really starts to back up on us. Is the purpose of the structure just to protect it from the elements? Uh, contain it okay. in in an area so that you know it, it would stay in one area. It doesn't um, blow around. You, you definitely wouldn't want it. You know, we wouldn't want to be just dumping it outside. Okay. And it's not a, you know, it's not a bird hazard. You know, birds aren't going to be attracted to it. It's not a rodent hazard. Uh, well, these, the structures have, will it have, it'll be protected on two sides with curtain and then the other? No, we would go the, inter, you know, the big storage containers yeah, the into models. So we we double stack those uh -huh. uh, all the way down the sides. Just yeah, basically like this. Yeah, exactly like that. And then at the one open end, they do have it that you can have a, a, fabric structure down except for a, a framed in metal drive through door that you could open and close and the trailer could pull in and could get loaded right from there. And it's truss construction? Yes. 
Um, that's the fabric structure. The the other steel master is uh, more of that Quonset hut, and it's a steel structure. And the, the fabric structure, I mean, it's fire rated. You know, they give you some of the fire information that's on there. You know, they're used all over the place. It's the reason why I'm sure the why the town put one up uh, behind the DPW yard for the salt and sand storage. You don't want that type of material getting wet and waterlogged and soaked. You don't want your salt getting <laughs> wet, that's for sure. Or your wood chips. Or the wood chips. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, it's a dry product. Um, well, I guess my question is what, I mean, we're, we're talking about a, just the structure. What's to prevent you now from saying, oh, forget the structure, or, you know, I, I'll just put it outside next to the building. Is there any limitation to that of doing that now? Trust me, I have a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's part of the gray area. Is it still, it's a recycled material, is it considered product now? If it's and a product, a if it's a manufactured product. product. I'm not sure. I think that's something that would have to be debated and discussed. Um, I haven't gotten an opinion from legal on that. So could it be legal or is it just a, a debate and a philosophical discussion as to the operation and what it is? Because then to the point, if he can just say, eh, forget the structure, then we don't have to worry about it being the sprinkler. I mean, it catches fire. It's going to go to the building anyway. Well, so it's be honest with you, in anticipation of, of this coming up, there happened to be an auction of a fire truck from Massport, and I bought it. So we, <laughs> we've got a fire truck on site. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, good like old-fashioned we, we have our, own, goes we have our own fire truck on site. <laughs> that's funny. Where are your hours of operation? Will this be something that's going on 24-7, and how will it be monitored? Uh, the, the, the waste handling uh, goes on in, in the, the, the existing building. This would just be a, a conveyor wood material dropping into the, you know, I'm calling it a temporary building because that's what they refer to them as, would be just dropped into that uh, proposed building. And so it would convey and drop into a conical pile, and then we'd be loading it uh, into trailers as they became available. And then you stack the trailers in the building. Yeah, we could start. We could stockpile the trailers right there inside. So I guess that the the, the product, if you will, is contained within a metal trailer. Uh, once yeah, once it's off the ground and in the trailer, that's really how we do it right now. It's inside a big bunker inside the building, or it's in the trailer. It's one or the other. And this wood waste is this wood material is uh, from C and D. That's been Correct. shredded. Correct. with the hours? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Okay. Like if it's something that's going on 24-7 no. and noise, and I, I don't, I've never no, don't, been no, to we don't, No, we don't, no, we don't, we don't currently operate 24 hours okay. a day. What are your hours of operation? Uh, we're, we usually start processing right around 7. We're there earlier accepting material, but we really start processing around 7. Uh, depending on what time of the year and how much material we have in the building, we could process till 4, 5 o'clock. Okay. And that's typically what we do okay. right Somewhat business hours, like not overnight, okay. not. And Saturdays, you have the recycling center open for residents? Yep. Uh, well, uh, recycling drop off is open to residents six days a week, Monday through Friday, uh, right up till six o'clock. Yeah. We, we lock the gates at six. Yep. And then on Saturdays till two. Yep. So we don't, right. we, don't, we don't normally operate um, the plant on a Saturday till two. We usually, if we were going to operate on a Saturday, we shut down at noontime, uh, but we keep the drop off area open till two. Okay. And that's pretty impressive, too. I like I've been there a number of times with, with my truck, full of mis miscellaneous debris. Uh, the, way, uh, the way you're going in, they get the gross weight. The way you're going out, they get the net weight. And they, and they charge it. Simple, quick. They tell you yep. where to go. Yep. Very North, efficient. North Andover residents you know, pay seven cents a pound. There is no minimum. It's, that's it. Seven cents a pound. So discounted from anybody else. That's the reason why we always ask where you're from. And people ask, why do you want to know? Right, so just, just the questions that, that we still have open are waste versus product, um, yep. what the building department has to say, whether this is um, uh, exceeds the intent of the site assignment. We've got legal, the building department, with maybe fire department weigh in on this at some point. Yeah. Um, so we really can't answer a lot of these questions tonight. But, but, but this is, we at least identified what the questions are. At least we have a solid 
plan submitted to DEP as to what the right because we've, we've only are talked be. about concepts before, so yep. now we right. actually have something submitted yes. to us on paper. Yep. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as the, I mean, the sprinkler system within the existing building is a dry system, yep. so um, it, you know, there's there's air in the pipes right now that are holding back the water. Mm -hmm. So if we had to extend the sprinkler system into the the new structure, I'd rather not. But right. It, but I mean that that would be determined through. If we do the site assignment or not, that would be step one. Building department would then be involved in terms of fire safety, building safety, right. building permits, things like that. But that, I can get answers. It's not our jurisdiction, but it is a, still a concern. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I can get, I've been trying to get answers to some of that stuff already. Um, I can probably get some of those ironed out and even in writing, probably, probably may, maybe next week. All right. So basically, this would be right for discussion next month. Yes. Okay. Um, Maybe site visit if anybody, if you guys want to do Saturday, that works better with some of your schedules. Um, I can make myself available, of course, and I'm sure Jeff will as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, or any day during the week, you guys are around, have some time. Uh, maybe we can start an email chain and pick a day and time. Great. We don't have to resolve that tonight. No. 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 All right, anything else on this particular business side? No, I just wanted to get this information to you so you can see it. You get the site assignment now. Um, you have a synopsis that I basically put together what is the questions that the site assignment and the proposal raise. Do you um, want me to get um, some additional you, copies made for you? Could you give me some of these? I can get, I can get these to you guys. Yep, sure. I'll get those. It just a little bit more specificity in terms of some of the uh, plans, locations, diagrams. Like the conveyor belt system, I think I was amazed that it's actually tubular and self-enclosed. That's pretty neat. So I was like, oh. Because I thought of that, too. That was one of my things was conveyor belt up high. Is that a danger or, or is there any? Yeah, no, they, they make those uh, tubular chain conveyors up to 12-inch. Yeah. So it, it, can, it can pull a lot of material. Okay. So I'll get some more of these. I can drop them off for you guys, take a look at them. Yep. How, how, many, how many more do you want? You want 10 in total? Anybody want one? I'll take one. I'll take one. You can scan it in there. Uh, oh, you can send, a, send me a PDF. Yeah. yeah. That'd be extra oh, you want them in PDF? PDF? Yep, I can do that too. All right, I'll send that over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Save the trees. <laughs> okay, we will close that item of business and we'll go to our next esteemed desk guest who got the memo on the red, white, and blue shirt. <laughs> Hi, uh, Please introduce yourself to the people who might not know you. Yes, uh, Ron Beauregard. I am your tobacco control agent, to, um, and I work on behalf of 16 other communities that also uh, utilize my services, including nearby Andover, Haverhill. I won't go through them all. Um, thanks for inviting me. I know it, it's funny. I, I brought a few samples, and it was reminiscent. I was mentioned to Joe. Um, I remember, was it four or five years ago, um, when North Andover took the lead in restricting flavored tobacco, um, it, you were among the first do half dozen that did it within the, in the state. And now since then, and I'm sure the reason why Brian and, uh, and I had conversed, why you invited me is that there's been a new chapter and uh, a new issue in particular with the vaping. And so I'm going to just provide a quick outline of the issue um, in the policies that have been attempted um, in both North Andover as well as area um, communities in the state. I mean, the issue, uh, and, I'm, and I'm using the statistics from the Department of Public Health. The Department of Public Health indicates that 41 percent of high school students in the state have at least tried a vape. And um, apparently 20 percent are regularly using it. They, use, they, they come up with that statistic with uh, 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 surveys of the students um, that uh, indicate, did you use a vape within the last 30 days? There's a lot of anecdotal um, uh, discussion that the rates could be much higher. I have met with some school administrators and some of my uh, colleagues that do this work as well um, who are in the schools regularly. In fact, Diane Knight has been a great advocate in North Andover, and I know she's met with faculty and staff uh, here in the community. Um, now, the strategy, of course, that uh, North Andover took was they, they you know, took an early lead also in, in restricting the flavors to just retail tobacco stores, adult-only retail tobacco stores, of which you do not have one. Um, so essentially, there are no 
what we call traditional flavors available at the counters in North Andover. The exception that was carved out in the language in both North Andover and many other communities in the state is mint, menthol, and winter green. Uh, those were carved out because when we present policy to you, it, it kind of goes through um, uh, the Mass Municipal Association and the Mass Association of Health Boards to give a test, not only is it a good policy, but is it something that will stand a legal challenge. And because it happened to be the very same language that was uh, introduced in Providence years before you enacted it, and it was, and they were sued, uh, uh, and the, there was a lawsuit that then became a, a trial in the U.S. District Court, and it, and it was defeated. Uh, the tobacco companies tried to defeat it. They did not. And then they appealed it to the U.S. Court of Appeals, and they also lost there. They didn't appeal it to the Supreme Court. So we have what we never want to call it suit proof, but it was about as close as you could get to it. So that's what's, what's been going on at this point. Now, what we have seen, do you, do you mind if I just show you a couple of quick samples? Sure. Go. sure. I've provided you just with a few samples. The samples I've provided you with is uh, uh, an electronic cigarette with a charger, a starter kit. It, it's an unusual scent, uh, Doctor. I, I, it, if you look at the label on the box, I think it says gold leaf or something. That, and, and actually presents a problem for us in not capturing a flavor that may be labeled as a color. It might be labeled as some sort of obscure um, a name that doesn't really identify a flavor, but somehow that we can get a lot of opinions as to what the, the scent is. Uh, that, by the way, I purchased for a, a whopping 99 cents. It was on a special promotion, the blue. Um, uh, so there was a big promotion at that time. And unfortunately, there were not any you know, legal impediments to allow that to occur. The other product I provided to you, and the mint is open, by the way. I just speak, yeah, the mint is open. And you can probably, if you wanted to take one of the pods out, you could. But basically, the jewel that you see, I have it connected to the magnetic charger, uh, the, the classic, uh, many have called this the iPhone of vapes, and it's of course the most popular among youth. Um, each one of the pods that you see there in the box, there's four of them, contains as much nicotine, just that little, that little pod, as much as nicotine as a pack of 20 uh, cigarettes. So uh, it's potent stuff. Uh, it, the idea of it is supposed to be that it provides a great substitute for smo uh, versus smoking without combustion. And I'll just tell you, the, the, the crux of this whole issue among the scientific community and the, uh, those who study this issue is it's a, it's a dual-edged sword. The argument, the argument is that on one edge that you're able to help people move from one product that is probably the most dangerous product to use, combustible tobacco, cigarettes, and go to a less problematic. By the way, that last thing that you're holding, doctor, is the, what we call a traditional the juice. And uh, that one, I believe, is strawberry milk. Um, and that's used for more uh, conventional pods uh, and vape devices. I can't remember what the nicotine level is in that one. Um, but uh, those, I think, are the items there. By the way, the vape pods that you have from Juul are mango, which would not be permitted in town right now, mint and menthol. Mint and menthol would be allowed. Um, anyways, the, on the dual-edged sword, the argument has been made that these could help people quit smoking. And when the company was formed, uh, Juul, uh, that was their argument, that that's what they wanted to do. And I can't deny, I go to many vape shops in the collaborative that I work in, and there are folks that really believe in this. With the bottle that you see, the strawberry milk, I want to call the, um, again, the more conventional vape shops. The, the argument is that you move from higher levels of nicotine to lower levels of nicotine, eventually weaning yourself off to either stopping completely or to go to a zero nicotine product. 
unfortunately, and this is what the FDA has been uh, battling, and the Surgeon General, and the Attorney General, is that the other edge of the sword is doing a lot of cutting. <laughs> um, and the cutting is in the, you know, the just explosion of youth use, and the perception by many of the youth that it is safe. The studies all show um, it's pretty it's pretty consistent. There could be squabbling about the amounts, but there is heavy metals, lead, tin, um, in, in, the, in the vape. There's certainly nicotine, which the Surgeon General and the CDC have been very clear that um, people sometimes think that isolated nicotine is not problematic, but uh, to the adolescent brain, and the, and the brain, I guess, is considered adolescent right up into the mid-20s in terms of how it forms, and there can be all kinds of in negative impacts to learning and memory. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any debate about that. The major question is, is how can this product exist legally and not cause the very concerning issue among youth? Now, again, the one way was to, to take those products and move them into the adult-only vape shop or smoke shop. There's issues with mail order, um, which is a problem, although it appears that it is not the majority way that youth receive their um, vapes. Um, they, they, they do get it from a br brick and mortar um, establishment. Another thing I want to bring in terms that's, that's concerning is there was hope that Juul, for example, was going to be what we call a, a part of the purest movement in the electronic, I'm gonna, I, it's my wording, it's not, I mean, it's not that I'm coining, but that it was really used for purposes of weaning yourself off of tobacco. The problem is, you, many of you may know, that Juul was um, allowed Philip Morris, the largest manufacturer of tobacco, cigarettes, to buy a 30, is it 35? I think it's a 35 percent, yeah, 35 percent share for a paltry $12.8 billion. So that really brings into question the motives uh, of the product that was supposed to be the anti-tobacco product, not the I'll join with you and be part of the game of putting it in, in front of the public and promoting it. Having the very purveyors of the product that you are rallying against and joining them it is concerning. So I hope I laid out a little bit of the problem. There, has been, there have been some strategies. I'm going to, I'll pass out very quickly the yes, what the state has done. The Department of Public Health has, in July of 2018, they, they came up with a campaign. Um, and the focus of that campaign was predominantly um, to inform parents um, how to talk to their kids about vaping and, um, and to alert parents and, and all those concerned with what the dangers of vaping are. So I'll just pass those out. I'm not going to go through this. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight it very quickly. Again, it's a, it's a very straightforward um, uh, brochure about what are vapes. I mean, what I passed out to you, I'm sure many of you are fairly familiar with the product, but um, I hear, for, again, from my colleague Diane Knight, as well as others that do this work, that people are just absolutely blown away by what is out there and what they really look like and what they smell like. Um, you didn't get to open the mango, but so believe me, it's about it's a strong uh, scent. They all are very strong. Um, and by the way, on the flavor, it's sort of preaching to the choir. But uh, the board here in North Andover recognized that, uh, and they agreed with the uh, various studies, whether it be from uh, the peer-reviewed Health Affairs or the CDC or the Surgeon General, that said, why do manufacturers add flavor to tobacco and to vapes? 
it isn't to make it less appealing, it's to make it more appealing. It's give it a pleasant smell, give it a, uh, the studies have shown that it provides a high curiosity to try among youth. Um, it is a, a manner which um, the youth tend to like more even than, than the adults, and, and it reduces the harshness of the tobacco being ingested or the vape. The other, the other piece I gave you are tips for talking with your kids about vaping, because a lot of parents have had difficulty in trying to explain to their kids that they are the guinea pigs uh, for this product. While many, I, th I think one thing I like to call upon those who are strong proponents of vaping, and we all know that in any issue, someone can be overboard and overstate their, their case on either end. But the one thing I get troubled by is the, say, lack of uh, evidence that these uh, vapes are, uh, are causing anything near the, uh, the damage that tobacco does. And this is a big issue, by the way, in, in England, for example. As, as the evidence grows, while some, there may be some health advocates outside the United States that might regard it as a safer alternative and even promote it to some extent, the jury is still out because there are more and more studies that come out to find formaldehyde, again, the heavy metals, and other problems with long-term usage. So we're, we're trying to focus on addressing this to the, the, the youth, which goes to the next, uh, that was July of 2018 that I um, uh, gave, uh, July of 2018. And then this, just this month, um, technically last month, they came up with this. These are all not shiny brochure, I apologize. I had to download them. But at least you get the gist of what they're providing for their next campaign. Again, I know the board just wanted to know what is, what is the state doing and in, in, in what can you do. Um, the gist of what I've passed out to you, which I should have kept a copy for myself, but my memory tells me that there's, um, there's, there's like four clings. Uh, they, they're going to see they're like a one pager that says uh, one equals 20. Uh, that's, that's making reference to my earlier statement that one of those pods equals um, uh, 20 cigarettes. Um, there's, there could be some backlash about, you know, same dangers, uh, different products, same dangers. Uh, it, it, it certainly, you know, reasonable people can start debating about that, but what they really are trying to focus on is the dangers of cancer-causing addiction, nicotine. Those are all similarities. And you can start a, a, a nice debate. They could probably do it in high school to have a debate club about the, the product. Um, but I think anyone who's in favor of pushing these as a, a thing to, to, to start up on, uh, especially when someone was not predisposed to start smoking, is a, is a dangerous route to go. Um, it might, we might as well just start testing those that are using it on a long-term basis now. Um, so that's that. So what, a, so what do we do? Well, if I was here to tell you exactly what should be done and can be done and would be effectively done to, uh, to, to to solve this problem, um, it's taped, so you know it should go uh, worldwide, and I'd be a hero. Uh, but I can't do that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I always wish that they, they, they. Um, I mean, this is just a wish. It's not any. It doesn't go to the strategy. But if the manufacturers of many of the vape products were really true to their word and were um, wanted this to be a, a way to reduce morbidity rates. Um, you know, to help people who are smoking and to prevent them, you know, from getting sicker, they would have applied to the FDA to make this a smoking cessation device. That was the the unique idea of this device. I haven't done much reading about it, but though I believe it was invented in China, and the the dream of those who initially uh, manufactured it was for it to be um, a way to to save lives. And again, back to that tool edge sword. It, the FDA is just absolutely taken aback, um, and it's causing more problem than it's, than it's uh, curing. Um, what can you do that you haven't already done? Well, 
You know, the one thing that your authority provides you with is the ability to make reasonable decisions under Chapter 111, not to know the answers, not to know 100% how to go about it, but to tinker. Tinkering's okay. Your critics will always tell you, well, there's no definite you know, alignment between what you're about to, your policy you're about to pass in showing reduced rates. Well, sometimes they don't show till later on. Um, and, and if they fail, they fail. But at least you're using a reasoned approach to go about doing something as opposed to just watching the issue happen. So one, one thing that I'm seeing a little more interest in, and uh, they did it in uh, Andover, Middleton, Newburyport, and North Reading in our collaborative is to set permit caps. I know there's, you know, some uh, aren't excited about that. There is a, um, it's kind of a strange, in terms of it being uh, how it uh, deals with business, it kind of helps the businesses that are here that already have the permit. Not so helpful to folks that want to come in and sell a product. Um, but the argument could be made that, you know, maybe at some point you reach a saturation point um, for outlets to sell tobacco. It's not foreign. Um, the state has long had a history of doing this with liquor stores, um, uh, you know, to have only a certain number. Whether it works or not, that's, that can be debatable, and the, and the evidence can be tougher to come by in terms of a, a straight uh, uh, movement of reduced use and access, but it's there. Another thing that they're doing, which may or may be of interest to the board, is I have two communities right now among just a, a handful in the state that have done a cap within a cap in some that are considering just this cap within a cap, just this cap without an overall cap. What that cap is is it's a cap on vape stores uh, and smoke shops. So these are the stores that are allowed to sell uh, flavored tobacco and vapes. Again, you don't have one right now in North, in North Andover. But um, Haverhill, for instance, has four, and they capped it at four. So there's no more. And the argument is made that um, it gives us, you know, you, and, and, th and th through me, some more ability to monitor those very few places that do have, give, provi provide the access to these products. Um, Bill Ricker also did it. They have a cap of three. Um, so these, Burlington kind of started the ball rolling with that one, I believe. Uh, they were one of the first two. But I think there's only like half a dozen communities that have done this so far. But I think it may get some traction. And then the last one, which is probably one that may, you may have seen some things in the news about a bit, is the um, including mint, menthol, and wintergreen as part of the uh, flavor. In other words, um, restricting those flavors to adult-only tobacco stores um, that includes them. I think most would agree that there's really no, the logic follows that mint, wintergreen, and menthol are not tobacco flavors. Um, they are something other than tobacco flavors. They were added to provide many of the same benefits or problems that the flavors do, whether it be pineapple or mango or grape or wine. It's to reduce the harshness, to make it easier and more appealing. In fact, and this is anecdotal, and this is because, as you know, we do our compliance checks, which North Andover, by the way, has done a terrific job with. And those are those checks where we will send in the students to be sure that people are ID. North Andover has done extremely well with those. But in other communities, we have found that mint has kind of surged to be uh, more popular. Mango used to be the most popular among the jewels, and now mint has um, taken over. Now, how do you go about that? We have just a handful. Um, I believe, I didn't write it down, I apologize, but I believe it's Somerville and Needham and Dover, perhaps. I'm not giving Dover credit. I, I think it's Dover, but I know Needham and Somerville. They have enacted um, a new regulations that uh, will include these uh, three categories. It'll just be tobacco is the only non-flavor. It has to be a tobacco flavor to be not a flavor. Now, in the mass pack, in, in our mass state program, has opened up the door to that as a valid. Uh, policy for boards of health to consider. So they 
given it so much, you know, the green light. But it is a green light with a little bit of a yellow light right below it. And the only yellow light I, I, I'm obliged to say is that um, you, there's a chance you will be sued. Um, there's a chance you will get legal papers. Um, Somerville got legal papers. Uh, a big thick, uh, people are nodding in their head as if they've, they've seen legal papers before. And, and when you do something, and uh, when you do something maybe a little bit on the, the forefront. The, the early word uh, from our legal folks is that um, the Somerville uh, suit that's in Middlesex Superior Court may have a hearing soon. It was basically based a lot on process. This argument that uh, I won't go into the detail of the process because I haven't read the brief closely. But it is mostly process oriented, unfairness uh, thrown on them quickly. Um, but then the one that it always seems to boil down to is whether or not the substance part one is one I think folks in the tobacco control and public health field feel pretty confident about is they try to make that leap that it's arbitrary, capricious, that there's not a connection. For example, it would be uh, there's no connection because uh, vapes, uh, vape use is skyrocketing in a, in, a, in a community that has a flavor restriction. So the argument is, ergo, it doesn't work, it's arbitrary, it's capricious, it's ridiculous. Well, uh, the, the counter argument to that is it hasn't been in place all that long, and there still are other ways of getting the tobacco product, uh, whether it be online or from another community that doesn't have a flavor restriction. So um, there's a lot of confidence in it, and I right now have only, um, I only have one, well, I have one community that hasn't done quite that. Um, menthol, um, they haven't restricted menthol products, but what they've done, Bill Ricca, it's going to go, it just was passed in March, um, is they will, and they did get some legal papers, uh, just more of, uh, we're out here and we're looking at this right now, don't throw away your, your emails, which we would never do. Um, so we have all our, our, our memos and our literature and, and why we did what we did. Um, but basically, that, um, that regulation does this. It says that you can sell vapes in a convenience store setting, but if they're flavored, then, oh no, I'm sorry, I strike that. It says you, no one, <laughs> the only place that you can, the only place you can sell vapes is an adult-only retail tobacco store. It's big. Um, so that means all jewels, all blues, all devices of any sort. Um, that are vaping are not going to be in the convenience store setting. Uh, they have to be an adult only. And I'll leave with you this. Leave with this. And if you have any questions, is um, I think what I you know doing this since 2001 now, and I and I'm very proud of the fact. And I think you remember when we had the hearing. Uh, some of you when we had the hearing back four or five years ago. Um, I've always wanted to be someone who uh, would never vilify uh, the retail community. I have very good relationships with the over 300 retailers I work with in the 17 communities. We don't always see eye to eye, but I think views should be respected um, and, and there should be empathy for impacts on businesses. But I think in this case here, the, I think the, the vision is should we make convenience synonymous with tobacco marketing. Why do they have to, why does it have to be in a setting where it's convenient to get the, the item that kills more, it's the most preventable cause of death in the country and in the state. So why does that have to be convenient? You'll hear a few arguments that sound pretty good, and I don't know, I haven't, I haven't really gone through them very carefully, but there's some arguments, I think they were made in that brief, that if you take away vapes for the convenience store setting, you might be um, hurting those that might want to reach for a non-combustible tobacco product instead of a um, combustible one. But I think the more potent argument is that for folks who um, want to buy tobacco products or who want to buy vape products and even those vape products that they believe can help them curb or eliminate their combustible tobacco use, to make that separate errand, to make that separate visit to an adult-only store where they're 
monitored closely, and those folks have the most to lose if they do sell to a minor or uh, or violate your tobacco control regulations. When a convenience store, a gas station, a grocery store, and the like lose their license if they were to be uh, selling to minors or in repeated violation, it hurts a lot, a lot, to lose their license. But a tobacco shop, it closes them down. So it, it gives, on an enforcement level, it makes it easier. Sorry if I've gone on long. I, I always hate it if I give everyone a glassy eye look. I, I, that's, that's all I have. Ron, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, one thing that's come up, and tell me if you think this belongs in our local tobacco regulation, is we have, the last time we redid our regulation, I think it was in 2015. That's right. Um, we addressed the sale of tobacco, and um, we basically created an equivalence between um, nicotine delivery devices. I think that's what our regulation says. That's right. Um, what do you feel, um, is it feasible, should we have a town local regulation that makes it also illicit for somebody un, uh, under the age of 21 to possess, to give the police an opportunity to confiscate or to give school department officials uh, the ability to confiscate? We're not trying to criminalize children, but at the same time, it's not only illegal to sell alcohol to children, it's illegal for them to possess it. And in some yes. states like Rhode Island, it's illegal for them to internally possess it. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I can give you my opinion and from what I can glean from what the opinion is of the, the program in general. Uh, my own opinion is that, that certainly outside the school uh, environment, that confiscation uh, for possession j just provides uh, now, let me back up a little. The, the, unlike alcohol, alcohol has an acute danger. For all the terrible, terrible pain and agony that tobacco causes, a kid's not going to likely buy a pack of cigarettes and drive off the side of the road and kill somebody or themselves. They could do that with alcohol. Um, so there's a there's an a, a acute danger as opposed to a latent impact of of you know being addicted to the nicotine and then consuming this product that could kill you. The other, of course, is uh, who would do this? I, I think you mentioned the local police, and that would be up to them, you know, to really decide whether that's something they really want to tackle. I think there's also, a, a, again, this is my opinion, a legitimate sensitivity to stopping people that who appear young, who appear to be under 21. It's a lot of stopping for folks, and this is probably the, maybe the major reason why I have some skepticism toward it is that from the talking I've been, I, my job is not predominantly to go into the schools and talk with the kids and such, but once in a while I'm invited either as a substitute uh, or at a health fair. I just was in Chelmsford at a health fair a couple of weeks ago, and wow, I mean, I, I talked to, oh, well over a hundred, probably two or three hundred kids just kept coming to my booth. So as soon as I saw vaping, I, I think some of them thought I might have been offering it uh, instead of, uh, you know, warning of the dangers because I had all of it out there on the board and everything. Hey, they were very well versed. Um, but there were, there's an, I think an addiction to nicotine, it's sad. As much as it's a health, I mean, just on an emotional level, it's sad. Um, the kids explaining to me, um, and it doesn't, one thing I, I mean, I knew this before speaking to the students, but it really does, 100% doesn't impact my view of their character, their ethics, their good, being a good student, because it just cuts across everywhere. Once that uh, seemingly harmless nicotine hit is accustomed, you're accustomed to having it, we're going to liken it to, for adults that don't smoke, and I have never tried one of these products, but whatever the addiction is, and you know, caffeine is a favorite one to kind of play with a little bit, but we all know if whoever you know, may indulge in uh, caffeinated products, how it feels not to have it. And I think that can be multiplied uh, based on my, just the, the, what I hear. And, and in terms of the, what the, the state or what other, what we're guided by uh, the state, it's somewhat frowned upon. Certainly for anybody like in my position, I, I, I am a, um, I work on your behalf 
and um, am deputized to enforce your regulations. But <clears throat> when you get in, certainly for me to do anything or someone like myself, uh, I'd be un very uncomfortable with it. Well, and as uh, Frank just said a few moments ago, 2015 we updated the tobacco regulations, increasing the age from 18 to 21. I believe the state did the same January the 1st of this year. And I also read a week or two ago that uh, Senate Majority, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, uh, is going to propose legislation to increase the age to 21 to buy tobacco and uh, these vaping devices, which is extraordinary considering that he's from ten uh, Kentucky. But uh, what's, what's the latest on that, you know? Uh, you, you summed it up. Uh, I mean, I could put in a little... And a little joke there is to say I, I wish he'd just kind of tag along the uh, flavor restriction uh, along with it, but I don't think that's going to happen. I can only tell you, you knew, I mean, the board knew that 21, while there were many uh, good arguments for it in regard to what we talk about, the adolescent brain and then the susceptibility to nicotine, and probably the other one that partnered with it was um, youth, uh, it was social access, you know, that it took away instead of a, a 15 or 16 year old kid trying to bum a cigarette or get a vape from an 18-year-old, or now it brings it up to the 21-year-old is where it makes it a little more of a reach. But it never was a silver bullet. It never was the, in fact, I can tell you that now that I've talking with many of the retailers and liquor store owners in particular, but all across the board, and even at the public hearings where flavor, all of the flavor restrictions, I think we have up to now nine of them or 10 of them, or maybe 11, I can't remember. <laughs> when 21 is met, uh, offered in the regulations along with flavor restriction and cigar pricing, there's hardly a word said about 21. It's been accepted. Um, it's just a, a resignation to it. In terms of the center, I don't know motives and such. Um, I, I, as with possession, I always get a little weary. Possession, by the way, is a an argument that's made constantly by trade group organizations that uh, get major tobacco funding, that that's where we should keeping our eye on, on finding the students. By the way, and I, not to get away what you mentioned, Joe, but I didn't, um, I'm going to lose my train of thought. Um, oh, possession. I was going to say about possession. I'll get it back. I, um, but, oh, pos oh, sorry. And I'm, I'm, I'm catching myself. I, I try to, my head's going too many directions. So, but uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's an encouraging sign. And you know, considering uh, you know this can be a, a nonpartisan issue, it can and only it can only help. But it isn't the end. It isn't the, the total solution. When you spoke uh, before that, uh, town regulation was changed in 2015, uh, as you probably recall. Um, I don't want to change the law at all. I don't want to interfere with, with business. I mean, these are our neighbors. These are our friends and associates and so forth. And yet you came in with all of these devices that are very attractive to kids. All kinds of things. And when I saw that and listened to the presentation you gave, you, you sold me that the law should be changed. Well, we Plus, don't, Frank was slap, slapping me around quite a bit well, at that time, too. No, but you know something? I remember that night, and the one thing yeah, a I... a little bit. <laughs> one, the one thing I remember about that night, though, is that it, I, we kept emphasizing that the retailer community was caught in the middle. They were, they were simply selling a product that was legal. They were simply selling a product that was in demand. Among youth, yes, and among some adults. Um, and... But the target was kids, though. And but that's where, who developed them and yeah. where, the manufacturers and such, the scene. And that's why there's a, a worry. You know, they, they don't want it to just be relegated to the smoke shop. So, yeah. So is there anything else we should be thinking about or based on that? Well, he gave us four things to yeah. think about. Uh, permit caps, a cap within a cap. Uh, a menthol wintergreen restriction and uh, restricting vapes to adult only stores rather than allowing them to be sold in convenience stores. Those are things that our current regulation does not do, as far as I understand. That's right. Um, 
it seems to me that that would be a topic if we want to open up the regulation we would need to schedule a public hearing mm -hmm. uh, but we could put that on our calendar I think that this is yeah. uh, low-hanging fruit absolutely um, and uh, we could uh, post a public hearing have a public hearing um, we would need some probably some help with uh, Cheryl uh, Sabara to basically uh, help us write the regulation in a way that passes muster but yeah um, I, I'm just trying to remember how we did it the last time whether we had her write something and then have us discuss it but we could give her the instruction that we want to address these particular things and how might they look added to our local regulation okay. and then open up a public hearing discuss and then vote so other towns in your in our area have already done it and we have some wording and some language that Cheryl's already looked at and approved. Yes. Let's incorporate that into our uh, 2015 draft. Yes. And I mean, start that process moving forward. Existing regulation. We don't yes. have to re redo the whole thing. No, no, we just add no, we, in a section or add in a, a few new uh, numbers here and there. I think we're pretty good to go. Um, That's correct. Yeah. Any, I mean, we can look at the entire regulation. Anything else you guys want to change in terms of violations or penalties or time frames right now it's uh one two violations within 24 months bumps you up to a second violation such as the um a1 prime we went through uh six months ago yeah so if i can say one thing so this is kind of my wheelhouse i'm a pulmonary and critical care physician um so all great regulations and everything like that, but I actually haven't heard anything about what's being done to educate elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids. I mean, there's a reason why smoking has decreased over the years and everybody's scared about COPD, lung cancer and everything. And we have, there's pretty good data out there about what these, um, uh, these vape cigarettes are doing. The most recent thing came out, the American College of Chest Physicians started looking at bacteria that's linked to asthma has been found into in these vape cigarettes now. Um, but I mean, I'm all for changing regulations, but I haven't even heard anything about what's being done in the North Andover Elementary Schools, the private schools in the districts, middle school, high school, et cetera. Well, you've done me a big favor. One, okay. if you've seen me looking puzzled, because <laughs> I keep thinking of what I forgot to say earlier, and you just said something that reminded me of it, which was, it went back to your question about possession. And w there are some school policies that are developed um, throughout the state with Cheryl's hand in that um, as, as a kind of a model uh, of boilerplate. But everyone has a different view of it, which is there is confiscation going on um, at the schools. Um, and the level of it, which meaning, can, is it returned? Um, and is it, is it is confiscated if you use it or even if you just have it? Uh, those are all school zoned issues. What you reminded me of is the yes, there's a, a third prong to the, the two that I just you know passed out there. The, there was a joint letter, this was really encouraging, from the Commissioner of Department of Public Health and the Commissioner of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And what that letter um, had in it was, and it was addressed, of course, to school administrators, is a, a toolkit with suggested curriculum, uh, informational campaigns that are tailored to the students and the parents, the facts on the vapes, and how parents can discuss it with the kids. Um, there's a lot in there. I didn't bring it with me. And I didn't bring it with me. <clears throat> I'm not a specialist in that area. I, I, I could become a specialist and, you know, bone up on it and such. But it's, um, it's really something that uh, Diane has a lot of information in regard to. Um, and my impact, or my uh, involvement with the schools is, as I mentioned earlier, of a limited capacity, pinch hitter. Um, oh, and I'm not saying directly to you. No, no, I don't. No, right. <laughs> no, I just apologize for not having as much. So that you're right. It's policy, and policy usually addresses the access. But then there's the other major piece of policy, and which is how do you convince the students in middle school? Of which, by the way, the study. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the. What, I always, I never, I always mess up the alphabet soup of what they're called. These regional, the, the yearly. Survey. I always forget what it's called. Reverse behavior survey. Thank you. <laughs> I always mess it up. I, I can never remember it. YRSB. Is that what it is? Did that just come out right? Behavior survey. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, just, um, 
at 10% in middle schools, at 10% have tried it in middle school. And again, from my discussions with the high school students, it's higher. But it's, it's one of those catch-up things with statistics and such. So yes, there is another push by DPH in conjunction with the Department of Secondary, uh, uh, Secondary Elementary Education to put together some, some toolkits. But don't, I mean, I'm not, be encouraged, but it is a constant state of learning what works um, for, a mes for messaging. Uh, what resonates with the students to get them to, because again, this, we're, it's like a repeat with smoking. It's, you know, imagine that with smoking where you practically cough and choke, you know, is it just natural reactions to it. And still the kids back then, I mean, luckily tobacco use has gone down, combustible tobacco use has gone down among high school, middle, kids, middle school kids. But now you're dealing with something that just seems to go in so easy and s just tasty. Um, it's a, it's a tough, tough, convincing. The, so, uh, I think the school departments have made really big strides in that. Oh yeah. I think was it last last year or the year before? It exploded and it took everybody by surprise. Yo, and I think there's been a lot of playing catch up and coming up with the programs and the education. They've been working and doing great with it. I know that um, the school department here got a grant a few years ago that, that I actually worked on a little bit with Cheryl uh, Barzak on life skills and choices and conquering all sorts of things, including substance abuse and things like that. So more can be done. I'm sure there is. I think it's the learning curve, and I think everybody's getting on board. Um, I know that you had a meeting recently with school department personnel. If you want to give us an update on that, but I think yeah, that's a great the, stride. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, superintendent, um, the principals of the uh, middle school and the high school, um, people from the uh, school health community and we talked about um, next steps and um, it's it was just really first of all it's just us getting to know each other yeah. um, but uh, there's there's definitely interest uh, among the leadership in the school department um, the police chief um, and others to uh, get ahead of this but I think we all realize that the that the the preventative part of it needs to be targeted at the fourth and fifth graders yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, to speak to Patrick's point about, you know, we can only do so much as far as regulation, but that's the that's the tool that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the one of the interesting things, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that defeated tobacco over the last 25 years, um, and regulation was part of it. Uh, higher taxes were part of it. Um, but a big part of it was the social denormalization. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, in order for us to be successful, in addition to restricting access and making it harder to get, I think there needs to be some thought about how do you make this no longer normal. It's, 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 it's kind of a cool thing now. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, from the kid perspective, it's like, yeah, adults are going to say it's dangerous. They always say things like that, you know. So how do, you, how do we... How do we make it less normal? Yeah, I mean, an example of that, I know the, the North Animal Board struggled with it for good reason, because it was really uh, tough to connect the, uh, the correlation between use and removing uh, tobacco from a pharmacy. But of course, the state passed that as well. They said, you know, no more tobacco or vapes in pharmacies. And, and it's loose. It's a little looser. But it goes right to the heart of what you mentioned. And it's, deno it's kind of cool going into a pharmacy now and not seeing anything behind the counter. Uh, no large boards of uh, tobacco products, just smoking cessation devices. And I think that is just one piece of that uh, vision that says, we got to make this less convenient. It's less uh, ubiquitous to see uh, this product that maybe if you do that, I mean, let's face it, that's why adverti advertising is done sometimes very, uh, you know, explicit, and other times it's more subtle. Subtle would be just having, you know, why, we know why, or we know why, but, you know, why is a, a board full of cigarettes, say Marlboro, you know, have a Marlboro pack, Marlboro, 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 Newport, 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 Camel, Camel, they're all just stacked up. I mean, they, they could just be one row or they could be underneath, but it's to give sort of a, uh, an acceptance uh, that they're there 
just as a normal product like you buy anything else. So yes, that's what the policy is, is toward. But the, but the Department of Public Health in, them, in, this, in the Department of Education coming together really says something, as Brian had mentioned, that there's, and I, you know, you can give credit or you can say it's catch up, but it's being done um, because it, it has to be. By the way, you have my jewel. <laughs> just want to make sure I don't lose my jewel <laughs> device. <laughs> okay. Did, um, did the school department or police give any indication as to whether they want you to think about doing a possession? Regulation? No, it was okay. just something that it was just something that was discussed, and I, I said I I've never heard of that before. Let me uh, ask our expert, yeah. about, you know, whether others yeah. are doing it or not. I mean, the, part of it comes down to the, the the whole idea of like marijuana tickets. Remember a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, they decriminalized marijuana and they gave out a hundred dollar ticket yeah. if you use marijuana in public. Well, people would just take the tickets and throw them away. There was no, <laughs> but what are you going to do? It's like yeah. I'm not going to pay the ticket. There's there's nothing else you could do, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of like you don't want a useless gesture, I guess. Right. Is what it was True. part of the discussion. So I said, oh, I'll I'll bring it up. But if it would give the school department. Um, ammo to take it away in school and say Board of Health regulation, you can't possess it, confiscate it, something along those lines. Well, one of the things that I said is, that, like, look, you know, we're a regulatory board, we'll look at our regulation, yep. but I said the other thing that we are is we are a public board, we discuss things in public, I said we'll make it a recurring agenda item and uh, we'll, we'll talk about what progress or what things that are new, uh, we could talk about, you know, Martha Coakley, you know, our state attorney general, <laughs> you know, working for Jewel yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and trying to defend it and saying that, oh, we're going to help people quit. It's a lie. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, Carol and I talked about this a while ago. I emailed Ron probably about three months ago about it. Yeah. And started the discussion of having him come back again and posing some of these questions to him and what Cheryl Sabara thinks about trying to do some stuff like this. I, I think that, that this is something that we should be talking about. Yeah. Uh, this will be kind of the topic of 2019. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a problem, and we need to hear from the public, and we need to hear from our experts, and we need to hear from amongst ourselves about what the best way to do this, understanding that, you know, we have a toolbox that has, you know, we've got a Phillips screw head driver. You know, we can only turn Phillips screws. Yep. So. Who controls, um, I'm assuming there's regulations about, there's the schools, but there's also public parks and public, you know, areas. Okay. Is there currently anything that says like alcohol is prohibited in those areas or master in law? Yeah. But but you can smoke in all those areas or no? Uh, master in law restricts it from public buildings, public places, or within so many feet of a public building, I believe. If if the park happens to be in school grounds, of course it's it's so prohibited. Thinking more like the soccer fields and the parks and non-school related because there are a lot. I've noticed yeah. in town a lot of. You, jewel you, type you, use you, in those areas, especially you, on basketball courts and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> you have the authority to pass that kind of a regulation. I was just curious because yeah. that's where a lot of youth are seeing it, unfortunately. It's just yeah. another thing. That you have that authority. Anyway. So, as of right now, there's no, no stores in North Andover that no. will sell it. No, uh, not sold tobacco retailers. Okay, not sold. Right. Um, so, how many places sell Jewel and other vaping products in town here? In town? Yeah. Oh boy. Um, I, would, I would say uh, probably fifteen-ish somewhere okay. in that vicinity. So they are allowed to sell, except they can't sell flavored products. Um, we don't have any straight retail tobacco places, so um, if we banned it, we banned vaping products from your typical retailers, we wouldn't have any in town. Well, the the only convert, I mean, what what it allow, just for the sake of argument, if North Andover were to set a, a cap at the current level of tobacco permit holders, and then set a cap of one or two or three, whatever, for, for, for vape shops or smoke shops or adult-only tobacco stores. Um, 
what it would allow is one of two things. One, for an existing business to convert their establishment to a business model that is adult only. We've had that occur in other communities. Or for someone to buy that, a buyer to buy that um, establishment and convert it as such. So That's what happened in Georgetown. Uh, let's see. Well, George, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, Georgetown, sadly, um, because of our funding parameters, uh, we used to have Georgetown for some years. There's a, are you referring to the smoke, the yeah, vape the, shop? The, the, the pool guy who became the smoke shop. Yes. But that would, they never had a permit in, in, initially. Um, they, they just, yes, they, they just went to that. Right. Well, that. the pool and tobacco store. Yeah, so you get your chlorine <laughs> and your vapes at the same place. You know, so like when you're on your on your floatable chaise. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. You. Thanks for no, thanks you for all the dialogue. Um, I appreciate it. All right, we look forward to uh, meeting again real soon and going over some potential changes. Thanks. Um, anything from our, our our health director? I think just a couple of quick updates. Um, Caroline had come across uh, an impact melanoma campaign that uh, we sat down and met and discussed and came up with a wonderful idea that we've already started to implement. Um, we've ordered and are going to be installing five public sunscreen dispensers around town at some of the fields and playgrounds and um, getting information out there about melanoma. So we've got uh, five orders that are going to be installed by the DPW as soon as we get them. Uh, Drummond Playground, Stevens Pond, Reynolds Field, Carl Thomas, and McAvoy Field will all have uh, sunscreen dispensers for the public. That's great. What dose? 30. Oh. SPF 30. So on the back of Caroline's report, she came up with and created these um, Placards are going to go inside the dispenser in a clear window that are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two of them. We haven't decided which one we're going to use yet. We may use both of them, one at uh, obviously different locations. And we're going to see how they go over, see how they work. And then um, depending on what we have for funding left towards the end of the season or end of the fiscal year, we can try to get some more um, ordered and installed this actual summer. So I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, Youth on Track is going to be up and running soon, no pun intended. Um, this year we had, I don't know what the final number is yet, uh, it was 97 uh, children signed up for it about a week ago. Um, Demi at the Youth Center decided that we should probably cap it at 100, which is uh, a huge uptick from last season. Um, last year was about uh, 70, so there's a good percentage higher than last year, and that's going to be kicking off next month uh, over at Reynolds Field. So that's a youth running program that we started with the Youth Center uh, last year. So this will be the one-year anniversary of our new program. And so it's been really successful, really happy about it. And Stephen used to run track way back when, so <laughs> he's going to run with the kids. Okay. Sure. Um, and obviously just Steve's been here for a month now, working hard. Uh, the department is moving along and keeping up with uh, the new spring season. Cool. Anything new on summer camps? Uh, we are working on getting everybody permitted. Um, we have a whole list of camps coming to town this summer. Um, Brooks being the biggest one with multiple sessions as well as multiple camps operating out of their property this summer. No variant, no variant requests? None. <laughs> no requests. We're just getting the applications in now, so next month there may be one or two. But this year, I think we're good to go. Um, Brooks remembers, obviously, last year and has it set up for uh, their transportation system this year. Remember the most interesting summer camp uh, variance request we had was, uh, do you remember the hockey goalie coach? They had a the goaltending. They had they had a they had a goaltending camp. Yeah, I remember one growing up. 
And they, yeah, they, 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 they just like fire pucks at young children. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Some kids like it. They did. I loved it. It's great. You were goalie. I was. Very nice. All right. Any uh, any other business that people want to bring up before we entertain a motion to adjourn? Can I make a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? I second that motion. All in favor of adjourning, aye. 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 Opposed, no. We are adjourned. <laughs>